So, welcome everyone uh, to our talk about implementing UEFI-based Secure Boot and over-the-air updates for embedded ARM devices. So, um, first of all, who are we? So, my name is Jan Kiska. This is Christian Storm. Um, let's start with the common part. Uh, we are both working for Siemens Technology. Uh, we are embedded um, Linux consultant and developers um, targeting in-house means not wherever, but in quite a few cases where Siemens is using embedded Linux, uh, we are involved um, at various levels and trying to get things uh, the right way done or the better way done. Um, uh, we are also involved um, in the civil infrastructure platform project. Um, so Christian is a part of the CIP workgroup on software update. Um, I'm leading the, um, the kernel workgroup and I'm also maintaining the ESA CIP core layer. What that is, we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, we are both contributing to open source, uh, whatever this is uh, possible during our work. Um, also maintaining, I'm doing some other stuff, maintenance from time to time. So yeah, it's all about open source here. Regarding the topic of our talk, well, if you've joined, virtually at least, um, a talk of us uh, two years ago, um, there was something about secure boot and over the air update or something like this as well. Um, so again, the same story. Um, yeah, that was basically showing the concept and next 86 implementation. Um, today we want to look further on that. So where are we coming from? Well, the old story, the old days were the ROM firmware. Um, nowadays we do that uh, more flexible. Uh, we've come a long way because, well, connectivity is everywhere, security is standard, um, secure updates are, well, no longer discussable. Uh, even mandated in some of our domains um, by the standards um, and you obviously want to do these updates not by sitting besides of this and uh, picking up the pieces after it went wrong but you want to do it unattendedly and um, that also means you have to do it in a robust way when something really goes wrong and your testing failed for whatever reason you want to roll back and you get all your devices into a consistent state in the field. So. Having all of that integrated and also presented in form of a reference implementation via our CIP core layer, that has been done um, in the past years um, and obviously also in a couple of project, uh, projects before for x86 based on UEFI. And now, as I said, today it's about looking beyond that. Uh, what do we have to do on the ARM side to come to something similar? So. A recap, where are we on x86? Well, x86 for practical reason means today you're booting from UEFI firmware, wherever that comes from. Um, you are booting into a bootloader, which is UEFI based. And if you want to do it securely, obviously um, the firmware is validating um, your chain of trust um, that the artifacts you are booting via UEFI have been signed properly. Um, for the purpose of our Embedded systems doing AB update. Um, we are running primarily with a bootloader, which does uh, the AB switching control. You could rely on UEFI for that, but well, if you are more skeptical or if you're dealing with a lot of various implementation of UEFI, um, you would better go it, uh, with an own bootloader. Um, that also has uh, the task of enabling a watchdog, which is essential if you want to do a rollback when some of pieces of your boot chain um, got south and are no longer reacting. That watchdog has to be started. That's not a service of UEFI. Um, so that comes with our EFI uh, boot guard firmware for x86. Um, continuing the secure boot chain there, uh, what you normally do is uh, booting a signed uh, kernel image. Well, if you only boot the kernel image that way, you have a problem as we've learned before in other talks um, with the um, init RD, for example. You may also have a problem with the kernel command line. Um, therefore, the common practice is to use a unified kernel image, so combining the kernel and the command line and possibly the init RD into one binary, in one UEFI binary, sign that and then uh, boot up from there. And then you hand over to the operating system domain um, where you want to obviously also validate um, that your file system you're booting from, the root file system is as you shipped it, um, so the, the read-only part of it. Um, you may verify, and as we learned, this is a good choice, um, with DM Verity. Um, and the persistent part that you want or have to change in the field, um, you may have to encrypt, um, and that's usually done with DMCrypt. Um, so then you have all the pieces together. Well, for DMCrypt, you also need a platform key, and on x86, this is normally done uh, with some form of TPM, may it be physical or um, 
implemented via the firmware. So to get some um, platform specific secret um, and decrypt this and well, then you basically have all the pieces for a common secure boot um, system together, which can be also updated AB wise in the field. So that's the situation in x86. Um, we've done it a couple of times. It works quite nicely. No rocket science, obviously a lot of pulling of pieces together. Now, how can we benefit from this uh, pattern also on, on ARM side? So if you look at ARM um, today, um, and I know there are other bootloaders as well, but the common piece you often get on the embedded side is um, yeah, some U-boot uh, enablement, um, which can do quite a lot of things and basically can allow you to do the same thing, just with a different pattern here. And with a lot of more custom engineering needed to get things done. Well, every SOC vendor has a different way of validating um, the artifacts you're booting early, um, so the firmware here. Um, you also have a different way of, of validating um, the OS images afterwards um, or the kernel image better, um, typically done with a fit image, um, signed fit image here. Um, you can use U-Boot for quite a few things, uh, as is one example. You can also do there the AB switching, there's a scripting inside, it's possible that to do it that way. I think there's a talk these days also about this uh, approach. Uh, you can use U-Boot obviously also as a driver for watchdogs um, and, and uh, start up your watchdog there, uh, which is a good thing to do. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of customized engineering needed. And furthermore, you also need it um, for um, the, uh, getting out the, the platform secrets, um, so managing the secrets to get in the end um, your decryption done. So that's the situation today and well, we could do it, we were thinking about it, but in the end, the ideal case would to be reusing much more from the previously shown x86 side. So and if you look at, at how ARM is evolving today, we are rather looking into also having UEFI there as well. Um, you just think of system ready specification there. So it's upcoming and with this inside, but also with the motivation to unify, not just for secure boot, but rather just for booting um, the right side more. Um, Alex Raff, quite a couple of years ago, started the idea of having um, U-Boot as an UEFI provider. And that was one of the kickoffs for also developing in that direction um, that we have more unified infrastructure there available. Still, from that point to where we are today, that has been a long way. But if we have it that way, um, what could be done now? So the pattern we see here, basically, if we have an embedded uh, UEFI provider is that uh, everything after that provider basically can be the same as we have done before with x86. And we will look into further details on the right side later on. What you also see, um, uh, if you look into the, the infrastructure for um, a trusted platform module, you have also some standardization approaches there. So with Opti being around for more and more of the modern platforms um, and even some of the 30-bit platforms, that's now an option to host um, the, the platform secrets and manage basically the, the platform specific um, trusted storage there as well. So there's also option to optimize and to unify that um, on that area as well. So um, the key element here is, as I said, then looking into who can provide you UEFI um, for your embedded device. Um, so they're basically for non six two key providers right now on the market, as far as we see on the open source market. Well, the standard one you may come into mind and say, oh my gosh, um, EDK2. <laughs> it's the UEFI reference implementation and very commonly used, or at least a common base on x86 firmware. So even if you get a commercial one in the end, there's often EDK2 bits included. Um, and it has have support for ARM and ARM64 as well. However, um, it, doesn't commonly, it doesn't commonly supported by your SOC vendor. Uh, there are some exceptions for that, um, but in the end you end up with something which is not yet directly fitting on your board in contrast to what you get via the BSP for your board. And there's also very limited driver support in upstream, at least to uh, what we've analyzed so far. Um, so also regarding uh, how do I enable my watchdog now, even if it's a simple task, the infrastructure isn't there. So this is something, um, if you want to put it in the UEFI provider, there's nothing like that. On the other side, as I said, U-Boot um, by now is, uh, well, it's the de facto standard for firmware. If you look for your common uh, silicon vendors, they will probably provide you um, some enablement for that or someone else did it in a nice way. 
It's, so it's vendor backed. It uh, has plenty of drivers for all bits that you may need, also to bring up coprocessor stuff like that, which may also in some scenarios be interesting for the features you need for secure boot here. Um, that is all there. What is maybe not that recognized um, by anyone or by, by some people is that there is also fairly advanced UEFI support by now. The only issue is it's, as I said, not that recognized. It's likely not broadly used yet. So what do you do if you want to do um, or want to use U-boot for um, UEFI and for secure booting secure UEFI? So one of the first, well, anecdote to say basically, we were shipping um, an embedded board um, which was uh, booting from U-boot uh, from and was doing the classic distro boot, so fit image booting. Um, and we were using default config of the vendor for that. And after a while, when we looked into uh, what's possible with UEFI, I said, oh, it's default on. Um, let's just flip in our image the bootloading process with Grub, Grub UEFI, and it just booted. So we were accidentally basically shipping already UEFI-enabled system uh, in the field uh, without knowing it. It's an open platform. It's nothing that you close down and configure to the minimum. So it was working as supposed. And yeah, at least non-secure booting was already working. Now, if you look at what is needed for booting securely, well, you need to continue your chain of trust. Again, remember the, the early stage, the piece basically from the ROM loader to your U-boot or whatever comes before U-boot or in the middle of U-boot, that is usually remaining vendor specific. But this is what you get usually pre-integrated by your vendor um, and you can just build upon. Now, when we're talking further, what U-boot wants to load or should load via the UEFI mechanism, um, and, and should uh, validate, um, you need some train of trust for that. So you, the easiest way to do that is to pre-compile um, the public keys into um, the U-boot binary. So you have a static train of trust. You could do the same with fit images, obviously, and this is now done with um, UEFI. That's one way. The other way, it's also interesting, but still under development and has dependency, is doing this via the UEFI variables and having the UEFI variables in the secure storage. Then you can actually also update the keys in the field without completely replacing your, um, your firmware binary. So that's, that's one of the first steps you have to do. Go one way or the other. So then look into hardening. Well, this is a general recommendation. It doesn't only apply to uh, UEFI-based secure boot um, and many of the patterns yeah, are generic. But anyway, look into that. Um, I didn't find anything like this described in that form so far. There were some indications what to do in general, but this actually is something that we compiled over the past years um, for actually practical doing it. Um, so one of the obvious things is uh, you have to make your boot chain um, yeah, no longer interactive, uh, lock down any kind of interaction with the bootloader, uh, because this usually opens up the door for doing something else than non-secure, than security booting. Um, you have to, or you should, limit um, your boot to the UEFI part. I mean, if you're just keeping on the legacy boot, um, that usually is, means that you don't boot securely anymore, unless you've done special metal on that path as well. But well, if you decide to go one way, lock out the others. So limit your, your uh, boot uh, procedure to UEFI. Um, another general security recommendation is to turn off features you don't need. Um, that specifically is interesting regarding file systems. So if the user can uh, yeah, or the attacker can replace some of the storage, which is one of the physical attack vectors, and, and, and place some nice file system on it, and you would have an implementation, but it's probably not that commonly used and may have some bugs, yeah, you just open up the door. Um, obviously, also network is something that you want to turn off if you don't use network booting on that stage. Um, another important thing to remember, well, either do a read-only environment, because the environment keeps... Um, all the variables that could also be used for booting and booting in a different way. So either make it read-only, or if you have some variables that should be readable, uh, should be writable still for whatever reason, um, there are mechanisms now in U-Boot, um, not that handily to describe, but there are some reference I can point to you, um, to make only those variables writable and nothing else. So there has been some work be done in the past years um, to enable that scenario. And yeah. As I said, this is just a brief list on that. If you want to look into some examples, we compiled the generic ones, but not completely secure ones in the ESA CFP core layer. And there's also practical examples for a TI-based uh, processor. This is from this uh, IoT 2050 device of us. 
So have a look there if you're interested in some examples. So next step, obviously, is then to um, sign and lock the firmware artifacts. That is, again, the vendor-specific mechanism. Um, don't forget to start the watchdog, as I said. Um, that uh, is, in the end, then taken over by Linux once it's running. So that uh, starting point should be in U-boot and not later. Otherwise, you may have some black hole there. Yeah, and another very important indication on that, obviously, test don't trust the whole thing. Um, as I said, this is still fresh. I'm not saying it's instable, but it can happen. And it happened, unfortunately. There was some bug that we found during the testing recently. It's fixed by now. So if you take the latest U-boot version, you have it fixed. Um, but it's always good to have at least these um, basic mechanisms also checked by your system test intensively regarding if there are security holes remaining on that level. So next step. Um, after you would basically, there is the, the UEFI payload starting and the UEFI payload for us is um, our AB switching bootloader, if you bootguard, um, which is quite easily or was quite easily enabled for, for ARM and ARM64 builds. So that's available, checkpoint. Um, however, what is now the challenging part is, or what turned to be a bit more challenging part was the unified kernel image. So, so far on x86, we used the pattern um, that systemd was introducing, um, a little kernel, a uh, little loader stub, which um, then forms together with the kernel and with the init ID and the command line string, and on ARM also a device tree uh, blob, um, that unified kernel image. And that whole thing is being pulled together with object copy. Um, it's a PE binary, so it's a Windows binary, an ELF binary, and an UEFI binary in the end. And the object copy tools you currently get from common toolchain releases you get via your distributions, they are not ready for that. So you can work around, obviously, by taking the latest boot chain or latest tool chain. If you're on Yocto, not an issue. If you're on distribution-based build system, that can be an issue. Um, there's hope. As I said, it's fixed. But the uh, current situation was a little bit of problematic, first from a, from a handling perspective. What turned out to be more problematic to our scenarios was this single device tree story. So ideally, the device tree comes in the system-ready model from the firmware. And it's perfectly fine describing all bits you want to have on your device. Practically, well, there is a life cycle of that piece, of the firmware piece, of the kernel, from when you're having your device a longer time in the field. You may start with a BSP kernel. You may later on end up with a mainline kernel, ideally. You may start with inofficial device tree binding. You may up in the end starting or using the official binding. So there is a certain thing that you have to plan for, at least if you want to do a long-term updatability of your system. In other words, this kind of bundling option of the kernel and the device tree, which is unfashionable, but it's unavoidable practically still for a foreseeable future. Now, if you have one device tree for one device, no problem, checkpoint, you can use this pattern. However, if you have an image which is supposed to have only a minor variant of devices covered with one image, you suddenly have a problem. There's only one device tree and you want to address them all. So we need support for multiple of those device trees, some kind of matching mechanism. That's what we did. Well, we first of all solved for us the um, unified kernel image generator problem um, by doing a Python-based approach, uh, pulling this Python, these um, sections together for the PE binary, and then we simply implemented um, a mechanism to choose from uh, the option of, of a list of device trees, which were embedded in this embedded um, this unified kernel image, uh, choose the one which matches what the firmware was providing before. Pretty simple thing. Eventually, we will also contribute to system deboot. Um, that's basically the needed step for that. Um, the precondition for that, to have this kind of device tree replacement, is that um, the, boot, uh, the firmware allows you to forward transport certain dynamic information that the firmware implants into the device tree via a fixer protocol. So there's a fixer UEFI protocol being defined and implemented in U-boot. Um, U-boot is working just fine. System D-boot supports it. If you boot guard supports it. Um, I think that was currently the situation. Um, EDK2, unfortunately, does not support it yet. Um, it's ongoing work to get this into the um, EBBR specification. Um, so it's an open issue on that topic. So eventually, maybe become standard and we become also available for other uh, firmware providers. So with that, we basically leave the UEFI domain. And I would also hand over at this stage. Yep. 
Thanks, Jan. So now, what, what do we have, actually? We do have cross-architecture commodity in the EFI domain, which means you do deploy the very same components across architectures, maybe with a bit of minor configuration, for example, enabling watchdogs or not. Um, next is the US domain here on the right side. And I want to focus on, on three things here. First is, how does a unified kernel image first find and then mount its rootFS? The second is uh, how to integrate integrity protection to this process. And the third one is obviously, as the title of the talk says, firmware update. So starting with the uh, firmware update, um, in modern times, updatability is probably the most important product feature. And commonly what we see is an AB scheme, which means you do have two copies of your root file system and one is actually selected for being the current boot path. So this is the currently running system. While running, you update the spare copy and when you're done, you're just test booting into this. If this has worked and the image has booted up perfectly fine, then this becomes your default image and the this select switches over. If not, you get a rollback and again you add firmware 1, which was the initial one and can continue or report the failure or whatever to your backend in terms of an OTA update. Um, this, of course, needs support from the bootloader, as Jan just said, which is available for EFI Bootguard as well as for Ubud and for other bootloaders as well. But it needs a very deep integration in terms of arming the hardware watchdog, which you need for having the rollback in case you, for example, deployed an x86 kernel on an ARM system, won't boot, so we rely on the watchdog. Um, you need the AP switching and most probably other features as well. Um, this whole stuff in terms of using SW update here, for example, is the, the flow how it works, is pre-integrated into SIP core. So you can just clone it, download it, play with it. It's a pre-integration asset. And what you can also do with this mechanism is once you have it available, means you have a general way of deploying artifacts, whatever this means, to a device. So it must not always only be firmware in terms of for root file systems. You can also use this mechanism to update packages or container images or what else, as you have one channel down to your device for this. So now, having done an update, um, how does this unified kernel image find its actual root file system? Um, the assumption here is that a kernel and its root file system is one package that belongs together. So meaning, you have deployed a kernel and it belongs to exactly one of the two <coughs> A or B root file systems. Of course, there is a kernel option. You can simply specify root is dev partition, whatever. But this doesn't unfortunately work in the A, B update case because you cannot know without asking the device in the field what its current boot path is. So it has to be A, B agnostic. And in case of secure boot, you also have the problem that you don't want to feed untrusted information into the boot chain, which means you cannot rely on some configuration lying around somewhere. So essentially, um, there are a few options left. You can use the file system UIDs. So in the init RAMFS, while booting, you scan the disk and search for the file system UID that matches your kernel because it's engraved, embodied in the init ID, and then boot it. Fine, <clears throat> may work, but not all file systems support this, and so it's out of the game for a general solution. Next one is you can use partition UIDs. Um, works the same way, but it's also not always available, and you have the, the problem that you have to write the partition table on each update, which you should avoid, which is not that good. So in the end, we came to the idea that we add a custom tag, image UID, to the root file system's ETCOS release, and then in the init ID, iterate over all file systems, mount them, look into the ETCOS release, look if it matches the image UID engraved in the unified kernel image. If yes, we have found our root file system and we can continue booting. So as the UUID is engraved also in the unified kernel image, means it's signed. So both find a match and the UID is protected by secure boot in the unified kernel image. Now you have booted a root file system, and this root file system is not protected against modification. So 
it happens to satisfy our mechanism of finding the UID in ETCOS release, but you are free to tinker with it, um, and as long as you keep this mechanism intact, you can boot anything. So what you want to have here is some kind of root file system integrity protection. And for this you need authenticity enforcement and most probably a read-only root file system. Um, as we have heard from Jan, you can integrate the Verity here, which is um, kind of a layering approach. You can use device member for layering block devices. And the Verity gives you the integrity protection in terms of Merkle tree. Means if you modify the lower bits here, the changes trickle up to the root hash and then you get a different root hash. So what you do is you prepare your file system, you calculate the root hash, and then this root hash you actually embody into the int ID, which then gets put into the unified kernel image. And while booting, you again scan the disks and you scan the metadata of the file system of the DM Verity block device and find a match between the root hash embodied in the unified kernel image and the root hash in the Verity's metadata. Well, congregations, you found it. And the bonus is that you don't have to actually try to mount each file system you find along the way because you can read it out from the metadata. So, as you've seen, there are many things here involved that you have to align proper um, in order to make this work. So, in essence, um, it's not that big of a rocket science, but you have to bring those pieces in a line. And doing this upstream is kind of a codified description of the big shared picture. Yeah? It's shared knowledge you bring upstream, so to not make this tribal knowledge, bring it out to the open. And as it happens to touch many of the core concepts or working groups of the civil infrastructure platform, it's a natural fit to bring this stuff up upstream first to the SIP project, which we have done, and you can find it in the ISA SIP core layer. This is um, an implementation more or less done with the help of the ISA Metable system, but the ideas, scripts, contexts, configurations, whatever, can just be copied over to any other Metable system, Yocto, whatever. As said multiple times, so we do have a reference integration, which is ISA SIP core that you can find here. Um, there are pre-integrations of those concepts presented along the line. Um, it's not fully integrated because, for example, SecuBoot is on the technical side, the realization on the box. On the process side, you have to do key management, whatever. Those things are obviously not to be found there. But the box side, the technical side is there. You can just take it and hook it up into your company's process and be done with it, hopefully. Um, there is a demo available on QEMO, obviously, for all architectures and one physical target. And on top of this, in terms of eat your own dog food, uh, we prepared a layer, Meta IoT 2050, for the Zematic IoT 2050 boxes. And this is essentially the device specific difference between the ISO SIP core and this one to get this box up and running. So there you can see um, what it takes to bring a new box or what the difference is, how much work it would be to base on ISO SIP core for a final product. So, in sum, um, this whole stuff, combining Secure Boot and firmware update over the years and rocket science, but it's uh, maybe too much for a casual Friday if you don't want to ruin your weekend. So, um, take your time to, to implement it. Um, most of the puzzle pieces are open source, so they are available. You just have to find them, qualify them, and bring them in line. Yeah. Um, and this is what we have done in terms of the civil infrastructure platform to give you blueprints, documentations, or even pre-integrations. So documentation in terms of code, which you can use and just run. And the more important part here is the testing and long-term maintenance. So it's not just a one-shot that it's out there to be copied or to take inspiration from, but instead it's meant to be a long-term thing that's tested and measured there. So with this, join us at the mailing list and let's make this stuff even more commodity than it is nowadays. Thanks. Now we have time for questions, I guess. Yep.
this one here. Um, so what we did here is we embedded this custom tag into the etc threes, right? And this UID is generated. So it's some random UID. And while booting, you iterate over all file systems, mount them, look into this. Um, when you have found it, you have found your matching root file system of your kernel as you are now. And this is essentially a shortcut of this mechanism. So the root hash is actually kind of a UUID. And with this, you don't need to mount a DM Verity block device or prepare it, open it, and mount the file system and look into ETCOS release. Instead, you can take the root hash as this UUID and do the shortcut. So you just keep verifying every partition until you have a match. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. you can also use this mechanism with DM Verity, but then you have to open the block device so the root hashes need to match. When they don't, you cannot open it, so you go to the next one. This is also possible. So it's kind of a shortcut, an optimization. How long does it take to just mount every, every partition? Uh, you can call it premature optimization. <laughs> it doesn't take long. Yeah. How do you update the root order? The root order is just an AP binary um, sitting on the ESP. And of course, you can update it. So using SW update, replacing it with the file, a new bootloader, a new AV boot card. Um, but that's a sensible operation to do, obviously. If you crash the bootloader, well, then you are a No, there is no AB in the bootloader in this case, not in the general concept here. Um, you need to have one core bootloader, which you don't touch. On top of this, you can chain boot, for example, if you boot guards too, if you want to have to. But updating this core, this single point, is then still the problem. So you don't solve it by putting two there. You always have one single point of failure, except for the case that you have um, support in the UEFI BIOS wherever to have two different ESPs or something. But this is not the general case. So yeah, there are solutions, but not the general one. Not the one you buy from the typical vendor. And you mentioned one thing about not updating Yeah, this one here. So if you write to a partition a new update package, which is a partition image, you may write a new UUID to this. Yeah? And in order to recognize this, for example, in the GPT, you may modify the GPT, depends on the implementation. This is bad. And except for, um, apart from this, it's not always available. If you don't have a GPT formatted block device, then it's out of the game anyway. Yeah, but if you ruin your partition table, then you again have a problem. Right. You have two. If it works, it's good. If not, it crashes. Better don't touch it. Yeah. And with this mechanism here, you don't have to touch it. Yeah. Again, um, so what we didn't tell is that EFI Bootguard also has two partitions where it holds this configuration. And the, the idea is that you don't touch, under all circumstances, your currently known to work boot path. So you always write to the spare other partition, right? Um, and following this idea, you don't want to write GPTs or something. So you simply don't want to touch single point of failures here. Um, that's the idea. Yeah, could be. Yeah. Um, so we also um, thought about having the configuration in EFI variables, like system dboot does. Um, we opted for not doing this because we do not know how reliable the backing storage for the EFI variables are. So we said, okay, better do it on disk. If the disk has failed, then it's broken anyway. Um, don't rely on other things you cannot influence. So it's kind of uh, doing it really hard. Did an update where you just changed the device. So root hash is the same. How would you do, how would you do, do that update? Because after you install the new image, you have the same root hash in both images. 
Yeah, if you do have the same root hashes in both images, then both images are readable. So you can use both. That's, um, I said it here, that the kernel plus executor systems one update package. Um, that depends on the wiring of your update procedure if this works. So for example, if you have kernel A and root file system A, you have kernel B and root file system B, and you now update kernel B and this one probes the disks and finds this root file system, although it should use this one, yeah? then you have X them. Um, this can be a problem, true. Um, that depends on how you wire up the update system, but in terms of integrity protection, it doesn't matter because both root hashes are equal, so both partitions are eligible for being used. You said you had problems with the unified kernel image not supporting more than one device tree. Couldn't you use the FITS format image for the unified kernels? Uh, then you are leaving again the UEFI domain. Then you're back in the classic root chain of your root. Yes, you can do that, and it has this mechanism, and it has these options, but uh, that's not the goal. As I said, we want to be on the, on the UEFI side just the same, and that's what we're achieving now. We can even think beyond that arm. You can think of risk five and things like this. So it, that's basically the idea behind it, having that standardized. I mean, it comes with a cost, obviously. You don't do this uh, sub-millisecond uh, root time optimization this pass. It, there's a certain complexity in it. But that's also in our domain, it's not the primary driver. We are more interested in having that path more commodity and more robust and more unified than having it more optimized. So different problems to solve, different sweet spot where you optimize. And this is the basically the generalization optimization. Christovic. Uh, essentially, this mechanism works with, for example, ROG as well. You just have to implement it. Uh, we happen to choose SW update to implement it as the blueprint in SIP, but you can use anything else for that purpose, yeah. So this is quite agnostic. So you have this one here, um, and the communication to the bootloader, so arming the watchdog, AB switching, this stuff. So the update agent communicating with the bootloader, this has to be done. Um, this is perfectly fine integrated into SW update. If you have this in other or even proprietary update agents, that works as well. So there is nothing that binds you to SW update. If you want to have the pre-integrated route in terms of the SIP core, then you get SW update. But you can, of course, swap it. Um, then you have to re-implement the features. But it's nothing that locks you into this. Mm -hmm. So since the scheme doesn't use fit image, so how do you support the use case of incorporating multiple device trees for multiple it, hardware? The multiple device trees come into the unified kernel image. So this is kind of a, the, the new bits on that piece. So the unified kernel image has a header stub, which is a, uni, a UEFI binary, which loads, finds out what artifacts are in this binary blob, the kernel, init ID, and then a number of device trees. And then it matches from that number of device trees the fitting one and boots that up the classic way. So this is out of, outside of the UEFI domain already. But as the whole thing, the unified kernel image is a UEFI binary, we benefit from the firmware validating that whole binary as being integral or not. That's the story behind it. So I think we have a short question, the last one, Francois. Yeah. Yeah. So the suggestion is to put everything into the kernel. There are mechanisms for that. Maybe we could evolve on that. I'm not sure how the, then the, the kernel command line is addressed. So I'm not saying that this is the only way to go forward. But it's one way that we practically choose right now. And I'm happy to remove pieces from our chain, obviously, in the future. Uh, also regarding the firmware. So if our bootloader eventually becomes over uh, superseded, fine, drop it, do it simpler. So this one here, the AB switching logics, can as well be implemented in the UEFI firmware as well, if it has support for it, meaning yep. extending the specification. 
the watchdog enablement is currently done with the hardware watchdog. Wave. He does have this software watchdog, which is essentially a timer. If you would bring this to the specification, every system would have it. And we are happy to ditch if he boot got on this one. Um, you can now do the same, very same thing in terms of writing DXEs. So um, WAFI drivers that do the job, but those tend to be specific to the WAFI implementation you get for a board. So you better offload this to some, some special thing, uh, which we can't really do with if you boot guard, but eventually we love to get rid of this. It's just for the transition. But for this, you obviously have the need and do need this. Not yet. Yeah, not we have yet. It internally, but it's not yet published. So the decrypt part will come, definitely, um, but current not yet. The problem is not so much on the technical side, the problem is on the process side. As I said, how do you hook up your whole signature management, key management, whatever, into this process? So doing it on the technical side is, is solved, but having the integration and doing this as a blueprint or pre-integration is the hard part. So it's not a question of is it possible, but instead how do you um, prepare it for being upstreamed in a way that's reusable by others in terms of not imposing our solutions to the old world, so to say. Okay. I think we are out of time. So, thank oh, you for your yeah. attention. We are around still. Meet us at the booth. <laughs>